So again, thank you for joining us here tonight. Uh, tonight's program is the Ghost Army of World War II. Learn about the secret missions of the U.S. Army's Tactical Deception Unit during World War II with Rick Beyer, the author of The Ghost Army of World War II, how one top secret unit deceived the enemy with inflatable tanks, sound effects, and other audacious fakery. This unit's little-known, highly imaginative, daring maneuvers helped distract the Germans in France and disguise the true location of the Allied forces. A little bit about Rick. Rick is a best-selling author, an award-winning documentary producer, and a longtime history enthusiast. With a take on history that is both humorous and illuminating, he has appeared on CBS News, the Discovery Channel, NPR, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. Uh, Rick wrote and produced the PBS documentary, The Ghost Army, which premiered on PBS back in 2013. He has also produced films for the History Channel, National Geographic, the Smithsonian Institution, Historic Mount Vernon, and others. His documentary credits include Expedi Expedition Apocalypse, The Right Challenges, Secrets of Jamestown, The Patent Files, and Time Lab 2000. And most recently, uh, he is now a co-host of a weekly history livecast called History Happy Hour, which can be found on the Steve Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube channel. So all uh, 40 of us or so, let's give a big round of applause to Rick for joining us here tonight. And Rick, you can take it away. Oh, well, thank you very much, everybody. And thanks uh, for joining me. I'm in my office in Chicago. I wish I could be there in Tewksbury in that great room in the library where I have presented a couple of times. But uh, we're just going to have to make do with uh, our technology solution and, uh, and see how it goes. So, so let's get to it. You're in the Army. The year is 1944, and you get your orders. You are headed to the front. But you're not headed to the front to be firing your M1 rifle or driving a tank. You are headed up there to put on a show for the enemy you must stage a complex multimedia presentation spread out over many miles. It's got to be utterly convincing to an attentive and discerning audience that wants nothing more than to kill you. Thousands of lives depend on how good a job you do, and next week you're going to have to do it again. And that, in a nutshell, was the mission handed to the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops in World War II. To carry it out, they used inflatable tanks, sound effects, and all manner of illusion. Now, just to be clear, this is not the famous D-Day deception, Operation Fortitude, put on by the British to fool the Germans about where the D-Day landings would take place. And that is a great story and a great deception. But this is something completely different. It's first of all, it's an all-American show, an American unit that went into action after D-Day and uh, basically operated a traveling road show of deception that went up and down the front lines over the course of the war in Europe. I came across this story 15 years ago. Wow, I was younger, my hair was much darker brown. Uh, it was a long time ago. Uh, and in that time, I have spoken to dozens of Ghost Army veterans. I have visited their homes. I have talked to their children. I have read their letters and diaries. I have looked through their scrapbooks. I have uh, scoured the archives. I have visited the battlefields to gather information on this story and try to preserve that information. And that led to the documentary that uh, Robert mentioned, as well as the book, and many other things. We've got had multiple museum exhibits and uh, a lot of media interest and various things going on. There are even people in Hollywood trying to make this into a Hollywood movie. And I never expected it to lead to all that, but I did know from the first time I read about it from the first veteran I talked to that this was a compelling story. And it's one that takes place at a really unusual intersection, an unusual neighborhood, if you will, the intersection of art and war and technology and performance. Not too many things happening there. And I also think it is, and I think you'll see this in the presentation, 
it's an inspiring story as well. So my talk is gonna be about 35 to 40 minutes long. I'm gonna discuss their mission. I'm gonna introduce you to some of the artists in the unit and I'm gonna talk about how we're trying to remember them today. And I've got a number of short videos as a part of this. So if you're having any trouble hearing them, let Robert know. There's probably nothing he can do, but he at least, you know, he'll know. And um, uh, because I want you to be able to, to see the soldiers and meet them as well. So now if you'll bear with me, I am going to do technology and I'm going to put that up. Oh, look, it's there. Is it there? It's there. It's very exciting. And, uh, and we'll uh, we'll get off because we'll start by talking. Oh, I'll go back. We'll start by talking about their mission. Their mission, of course, was deception. And these particular deceptions involved impersonation, impersonating other much larger units in order to fool the Germans about where those units were. Basically, to try to kind of get them off balance, get them off guard so that we could hit them where they ain't. And this wasn't something that this unit did once or twice. They conducted 22 different deceptions in the, battle, uh, the battles of Northern Europe, uh, across from France all the way across to Germany. And this is the cover of their official history. This was secret for about 50 years after the war, as was this whole story. But this is the cover of it. And around the edges of this cover are the insignia of every unit that they impersonated or were attached to at some point in the war. And as you can see, if you look around there, there are 36, if you're a really fast counter, there are 36 insignia on that cover. So this unit got around. So how did they execute this deception mission? Well, they used a multimedia approach and they went to war armed with three types of deception, visual, sonic, and radio. Now, visual deception is probably the thing that most people know about. It's certainly the most striking thing about the unit because they used inflatable dummies to fool enemy aerial reconnaissance. For example, dummy Sherman tanks like this one. And this is actually a replica, but uh, they had hundreds of ones just like this. Here's one of the real ones. And they didn't only have tanks, they also had uh, everything that a real division or uh, infantry division or armored division would have, they had as an inflatable. So they had every type of artillery piece that a real unit would have. They had every type of Jeep and motor you know, scout car and truck that a real unit would have. This is a two and a half ton uh, truck, uh, an inflatable version of it. I usually like to, I joke with people, I say, how many uh, trucks do you see in this picture? Well, of course, there's three trucks in this picture. It's just the two of them are in bags and haven't been inflated yet. So up close, right, it's obviously an inflatable. But if you take hundreds of these, you can paint the landscape with a 3D masterpiece that will look incredibly real to aerial reconnaissance. And here's a photograph from a real deception that they conducted in March 1945 along the Rhine River uh, 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 toward the end of the war. And virtually every vehicle in this photograph is inflatable. Now that's really striking, right? And it has a lot of effort. And if you look at it, it looks real. And look at it for a second and ask yourself, well, what makes it look so real? And I bet you've already come up or some of you have already come up with the answer. It's the tank tracks that really do the job of making this look real. Because look, it turns out that if you have a 40 ton Sherman tank, it leaves a heck of an impression in the ground. If you have a 90 pound dummy, not so much. So what did they do? Well, they had a combat engineering company, the 406th Combat Engineers, and their specific mission was to make the tank tracks. They did other things too, but they had three bulldozers. And so when the guys were setting up and blowing up these inflatables, they are drawing the tank tracks in the ground there, laying them with their bulldozers. And that's the kind of attention to detail that was so critical in this uh, uh, outfit. If you get one detail wrong, if you had a tank that was there with no tank tracks coming to it, 
And keep in mind, they're setting these up at night. It's all in the dark, usually when they're doing this, except for a couple of occasions. If you have no tank tracks going to a vehicle and the enemy gets an aerial photograph of that, that may unravel your whole deception. Now, the soldiers who worked with these dummies found it an incredibly memorable experience. And I'd like to let them tell you about it. It was a little bundle of stuff, which a tank was in, all compressed before. You opened the bundle, spread the, the nozzles around, and inflated it. Pulling this amorphic shape out of it, and then watching it being filled with air and taking form, you know, like a monster. If things went very well, there were air compressors. If things went not so well, there were bicycle pumps. And if things went terribly badly, there were our lungs. In most cases, like a German tank, we could have it inflated and move within 15 or 20 minutes. The artillery piece was good. The Jeep was good. But that M4 tank, that was the beauty. That was a, that was a piece of work, it really was. Did you guys hear that okay? Robert, is that, is that coming through okay? Fantastic. Um, many of the veterans who worked with these had stories, uh, stories and stories and stories. And one of my favorites was told to be by a man named Arthur Shillstone. Um, and he was on guard duty um, shortly after they had gotten to France and they'd set up a perimeter around where they're inflating these tanks. And it's actually one of the times that they're doing it during the day. Um, and their perimeter is supposed to keep out prying eyes, but somehow a couple of Frenchmen on bicycles get through the perimeter. And this is a painting that Arthur made of this moment. And now his job is to kind of shoo them away and get them out of there. And as Arthur tells the story, he said, they weren't looking at me, they were looking over my shoulder. And what they thought they saw was four GIs lifting a 40 ton Sherman tank and turning it around. And they were looking at me, said Arthur, and they were looking for answers. And finally, I said, the Americans are very strong. So, you know, the, none of the original inflatables survived to the best of our knowledge. And so uh, I've worked with a woman named Tony McKay, and she's got a company called Starbound Entertainment, a big parade balloon company in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And she has made uh, six to eight replicas over the years that have been used in museum exhibits for presentations and other stuff like that. And I just actually took delivery of a new one about a week ago. So I was very excited about this. And since I couldn't bring it to Tewksbury to uh, inflate it, I uh, inflated it at the First Division Museum, which is here in Chicago. It's just actually just outside of the city um, to make sure it worked. And since you couldn't be there, we have a video that the museum made so you can see that happen. Thanks to the First Division Museum for, uh, for that video. Yes, the ghost army life is a, is a fun one. Uh, the second kind of deception that they used was sonic deception. This involved using recorded sound to fool the Germans, brand new uh, uh, idea during World War II. And the way that they did it is that they created for themselves a world-class collection of sound effects records that they recorded themselves and they recorded all sorts of sounds, not sounds of battle, but sounds of units getting ready for battle. Uh, truck convoys, tank convoys, the sounds of jeeps starting up, the sounds of troops digging in, anything that you can imagine. And then when they had a particular deception to do, they would say, well, what's the story of this deception? And they would create sounds to kind of match that story, and they would mix them together into a, into a show basically, to play. And they would mix them 
to a wire recorder. Now, the wire recorder is the predecessor of the tape recorder. I think it predates uh, many of you. Um, and, uh, but it's quite an interesting piece of technology. And I made a little video this afternoon just so I could show you uh, what the wire looks like. They are actually recording onto this wire. Um, it's about the uh, thickness of fishing line and six feet of it equals one second of sound. And so they're playing the sounds from these wire recorders over 500 pound speakers mounted on the half. It's very effective. You can watch it listening to it at night across the river you know, as an enemy sentry and you are like panicked because you hear columns of tanks, columns of trucks moving. Hard to imagine you can almost a number of accounts from one of the American the Ghost Army, where people said that they thought that real tanks were moving in. So, you know, we know that this was a very effective means of deception. And one of the guys in the Sonic unit was uh, a self described kid from the Bronx named Dick Syracuse. And uh, Dick told a great story that uh, didn't make it into the film, but I'll share it with you here about one night when they were putting on a, a sonic deception uh, and he was accosted by a colonel uh, from an armored cavalry unit that was in the same area. Here's Dick Syracuse. This one particular night we're playing a, uh, a concert as we would refer to it. And we had a perimeter between us then the cavalry and then the river and the Germans. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm storming up the road. This guy looked like a monster because he had a flak jacket on and there were hand grenades hanging and uh, carrying a Thompson submachine gun. And he sees, Lieutenant, yes, sir. What the hell's going on here, you know, son? I said, well, what do you mean, uh, Colonel? He says, well, he says, well, what are them tanks doing here? I said, uh, well, there, there, there aren't really any tanks. Well, uh, some uh, expletives suitable to the occasion. And uh, he said, uh, you know, the gist of it was don't tell me. I know what I hear. You know, there are tanks out there, and nobody told me there was going to be a tank on and I explained to him about the sonic uh, vehicles and, and what they were doing and, and, and why. And as it developed, he had been away at the, sta at the briefing. And, and it, it was too often the, uh, the occasion, a lot of the ground people did not take deception seriously. So he wasn't told. So his parting words is, well, Sonny says, you certainly could have fooled me. Well, it does make sense that if you're fooling your own officers, you might be fooling the enemy as well. The third type of deception they went to war with was radio deception. Um, and this is kind of a simple idea. It involves replicating all the radio transmissions of a real division that you're impersonating. Um, and that means you have to have all the radios that a real division has. So you have the big division radio for communicating with the whole division and radio sets down to the regimental battalion and company level. And what we're looking at right here uh, is a radio truck uh, with a division radio in it. Uh, and this truck is operated by Stanley Nance, who's there in the photograph. And uh, Stanley even made a little pennant. He named his truck Kilowatt Command and he made a little pennant for his truck um, uh, that he would hang on it. Uh, Stanley is 102 years old, still with us, uh, and you're gonna get to see him later in the presentation. He's gonna pop up, so you kind of get to see what he looks like. But they would take these radios, you know, and so they would create a fake radio network that's sending messages when they're on the move, moving to the location, after they've gotten to where they're setting up. And then they would tie the fake radio network into the real radio networks with the other divisions and Corps Command and uh, Army Command in the area. Uh, and so this was a very realistic way of fooling the enemy. And radio doesn't get uh, probably as much credit uh, as it should. It was one of their most effective means of deception. Uh, and a veteran of the radio unit, Spike Berry, really summed up beautifully the importance of radio. 
radio um, was the stage setter. Now, when you think of the 23rd Special Troops, you think of the inflatable tank or the sound guys, and they're great. But they have to have a stage on which to perform. And we provided that stage. We painted a picture in the German intelligence in their mind as what was going on. So radio would come first. Uh, radio transmissions might start 30 miles away from you know the spot where you're planning your deception for as if a unit is moving in. And then, of course, if the Germans hear the radio transmissions, then they're on the lookout. And if they see a glimpse of tanks the next day, or if they hear the sounds of uh, troops moving in, they're going to say, oh, well, it matches what we heard on the radio. So you can see how important it is that the story you tell uh, is the same story as told through all these different means of deception. Um, but as simple as um, the idea of radio is, it's kind of complex in execution because a lot of this is Morse code and German radio intelligence, uh, German signal intelligence was so sophisticated that they could recognize the sending style of individual American operators. So the Ghost Army guys had to be able to mimic the sending style, what they call the telegraphic fist of the real radio operator. So they would sit alongside the real operator, observe them, and then sort of mimic their style. So their sending speed, their places where they made mistakes, kind of uh, hesitancies, et cetera. It's really hard to do. Um, you can kind of Google this. Some people say it's impossible to do, and yet the Ghost Army soldiers did that as part of uh, their deceptions in World War II. So um, three types of deception. Uh, they go into action about a week after D-Day in June 1944 armed with these three types of deception. But once they're on the ground in Europe, once they're actually going into action, they realize that something is missing. And interestingly, it, it's not the brass that realizes it, it's the men, it's the enlisted men and the junior officers who are trying to carry this out, they're on the ground trying to put this together. Um, and it finally, this, this thought finally finds a voice with one officer, he kind of gives it a voice. His name is Fred Fox. And he says, we need to be more theatrical. And he kind of writes up the ideas that they have and they send it up the line, bubbles up from the bottom, not down from the top. And it leads to a fourth type of deception called special effects. And special effects involve turning every one of these guys into actors. Moving through the French villages so recently occupied by the Germans, they saw an opportunity to improvise yet another way to sell their deceptions, targeting enemy spies that might have stayed behind. They called it special effects. Why don't we put a stencil of the name of the unit that we were simulating right on the trucks? And why don't we start a counterfeit shoulder patch factory where they would see we were the 75th division, one of the divisions we did. So we began to put on their patches and put their bumper markings on. And we physically assumed the role. Only for every hundred of them, there might be 10 of us. They even set up phony command posts and against all army regulations, staffed them with counterfeit commanders. If you're gonna bring a division up, you better have a headquarters somewhere and there better be a major general walking around. And so we had to have a fool general do this. Some sergeant would pour two stars for an operation. Our job was to go in with our phony markings and phony stories we were pretending to be officers and soldiers from another organization. And we were turned loose in town. Go to the pub, order some omelets, and talk loose. A lot of the guys went to the bakery, got rolls and stuff, and said, we got to get an extra supply because we're, we're moving out tonight, that kind of thing. It was almost kind of silly, really. But I think what really confirmed the fact that there was effectiveness 
was sitting in a cafe and seeing a door open up gradually and somebody was taking pictures. We find out if like a division or a special unit had a particular song that they like to sing. You know, we get blitzed and then sing their song. <laughs> They really threw themselves into their work, as you can see. Um, uh, they mentioned counterfeit patches, and I just want to show you, uh, these are some of the actual counterfeit patches that they made. They actually had a gang of people, I think it was about a half dozen people in the factory section, whose job it was to make counterfeit patches, because uh, they couldn't get the real ones usually fast enough or in quantity enough to be useful for their deceptions. And then they made these out of tent canvas, and they uh, created stencils and then they painted them uh, over and they estimate that they made about 40,000 fake patches uh, to uh, supply all the different deceptions they did. And this is a page from a scrapbook uh, um, put together by Ghost Army veteran Seymour Nussenbaum and it was donated to the Ghost Army Legacy Project and to our archive. We donated it to the National World War II Museum and this is from last March. This is Seymour looking at the page of his notebook as it sits in a museum exhibit at the National World War II Museum. And I said to him, did you ever think that your, your notebook would be sitting there under glass at a museum exhibit and you'd be there to see it? And he said, nope, I never ever imagined that that would happen. So with these four kinds of deception, they used, they worked in concert, right? So they all would uh, share the same message. They are pulling off these deceptions maybe to disguise the move of a real unit or to um, uh, project force where there isn't any force. It depends on the situation and they could pull off one deception, travel hundreds of miles away, do another deception shortly thereafter. Uh, I said 22 deceptions in Europe with some spectacular uh, successes. They helped George Patton on a number of occasions. They helped Patton in France. They helped him uh, uh, along the uh, Moselle River, the border of Germany. They helped him during the Battle of the Bulge. The deception planners loved Patton, and I think Patton returned the love. This is what one of the deception planners said about Patton. He was one of the greatest team players we ran into over there. He would do anything you asked him to in the interest of the overall picture. So I always think that this is kind of a, a great window into Patton's generalship. But the Ghost Army, they started in June uh, 44. They conducted deceptions all the way to the end of the war. I don't have um, the time to tell you about everyone, but I want to tell you about one thing that I find particularly interesting. It's a week in November, 1944, where they conducted three simultaneous deceptions in three different spots using three different kinds of deception. So bear with me here. You have a group of radio trucks is pulling off a deception where they are pretending to be the 4th Infantry Division. But at the same time, a bunch of other guys are setting up inflatable infantry, pretending to be the 20th Corps artillery. And they, when they pretended to be artillery, they also used flash canisters. So they could make it seem, especially at night, as if these guns were actually firing. If you look at the date on this photo over on the left, this is actually, it's dated November 7th, 1944, with the date and month reversed there. Um, and this is actually a photo from that uh, particular deception. But meantime, yet another group is using special effects to pretend to be the 90th division. And in each case, they, the real division is on the move to a new location, and the Ghost Army is trying to hide that fact from the Germans. Uh, and I think this week of the triple threat really shows off uh, how great they were. And you know, it's not like any of the guys told me and said, oh, there was the week where we did three deceptions simultaneously. They took that for granted. It was me looking at the uh, operations reports and kind of putting the dates together and saying, oh my God, they did these all at exactly the same time. So I think it's a particularly impressive uh, accomplishment of theirs. As far as their impact in the war, a top secret US Army report done 30 years later put it this way, 
Rarely, if ever, has there been a group of such a few men which had so great an influence on the outcome of a major military campaign. So, I think they really were the unsung heroes of the war against Nazi Germany. Now, there's a second aspect of this story that I want to tell you about. I alluded to it at the front. When the U.S. Army created the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, they took pre-existing units and they put them together to create this one. And to handle visual deception, the Army picked the 603rd Camouflage Engineers, which was a unit filled with artists. And these artists painted and sketched their way across Europe using stolen uh, minutes of time to create a record of, of their war as it looked to them, not part of their job. I mean, this is just what they did in their spare time, like keeping a diary, a sort of a visual diary. Uh, and so trying to capture all the different places they'd been and things that they had seen. And this sketching, this painting that went on started as soon as they arrived in Normandy. A few miles from the Ghost Army's first bivouac was the Normandy village of Trevier. The artists were drawn to a bombed out church off the town square. These were some of the first sketches I did. They were not too long after the invasion. In the remains of this church. We might have had three or four guys in there sketching. We were sleeping in hedgerows and foxholes, but nothing kept us away from going someplace to do a watercolor. I was not the only soldier with a sketchbook. I'd have sketched whether I was the only soldier or not, but to be quite honest with you, I think it helped keep me in balance. I think it kept my sanity. The last guy there was uh, Victor Dowd, and that was a picture of him too. And he's he's passed away, but but while he was alive, he lived in Westport, Connecticut. And I always said that that uh, Paul Newman, who also lived there, was, I guess, the second best looking guy in Westport, Connecticut, because Victor Dowd undoubtedly was the first one. Um, there were uh, a number of the artists who were in this unit uh, went on to have striking post-war careers, and some became quite famous. So Ellsworth Kelly. The minimalist painter and sculptor was in this unit. And I don't know if you've seen any works by Ellsworth Kelly. They're in many, many museums uh, across the country. They are modern and minimalist, and they look nothing like uh, the paintings you see here that he did during the war when he's still kind of figuring out who he is and, and what he wants to be. But he was part of this unit. There was a 21-year-old kid from Indiana named Bill Blass, who served in this unit. And those uh, of you old enough to remember know that Bill Blass was a pretty darn famous fashion designer in the 1970s through the 1990s. And this is a caricature of Bill done by one of his fellow soldiers, uh, Jack Macy. Uh, it is said that Bill Blass um, took apart his uniform and then sewed it back so that he had the, uh, he had the uh, tailored enlisted man's uniform and that he was the best dressed soldier in the U.S. Army. I don't know if that's true. It was also said that he uh, read Vogue in his foxhole. Uh, it's what Jack Macy told me about him. Hard to imagine and yet possibly true. Bill, um, he sketched and painted in the war too, but he is sketching women's fashion. And this, he had this notebook and he's uh, sketching uh, uh, outfits that, that he's imagining uh, and he's even thinking about his post-war career, thinking about the fashion industry. And on the cover of this wartime notebook, you might see here that he's drawn the mirror image bees, which years later become the logo of his fashion empire. So he was young, but he knew what he wanted. He was thinking about it uh, early on. And uh, that's kind of a, a cool thing. And there were many others too. We have identified in our research 
approximately 100 soldiers uh, in the 603rd who were artists. And I think that their work offers a unique perspective on World War II, a great visual record of the journey of this unit, and that it's a very important part of this story. My wife and I lead a, a ghost army tour of Europe for Stephen Ambrose historical tours. Um, we've done three. The fourth one's supposed to be in September. I think we can all accept now that this is not going to happen, probably not going to happen. Um, it'll probably be moved to next year. Uh, and you, if you're interested in this, we follow the route of this unit from England through France and all the way to Germany. And you can read uh, more about it at stephenambrosetours.com. One of the stops on this tour is the American Cemetery in Luxembourg. 5,076 GIs are buried there under rows of gleaming white crosses. And up at the front is probably, you can argue about this, but probably the most famous soldier of World War II, General George Patton. And his grave is a big, uh, magnet for tourists. You know, the buses come in and they park in the parking lot and people walk to his grave and the tour guides, you know, set them up in a circle and talk to them about it. I've done it myself. Way in the back of the cemetery, there's another George buried. Um, and he doesn't get too many uh, tourists to visit him. His name is George Petal. And he was one of the radio operators in the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, one of those guys sending out phony messages to attract enemy attention. And he did that all too well on March 14th, 1945, during Operation Bouzonville. And I just want to read you a short excerpt from our book about that. As the deceivers were getting ready to move out, German artillery opened up on them. Private Harold Lehner was standing by one of the trucks when there was a shattering, smashing, blinding series of explosions around us. The ground shook and heaved under their feet. Sergeant Victor Dowd was sitting in a truck full of soldiers with his driver when a shell landed in front of us and then another shell flew over our heads and hit the truck behind us. And I was thinking, do I tell them to get the hell out of here now? And with that, the signal came and we moved. And it was just a case of luck, Dowd recalled years later. Luck is the paramount word. If you're in the wrong place, you can be dead. If you're in the right place, you can live to be as old as I am. Sergeant George Peddle, a six foot collegian from Philadelphia serving in the radio company was riddled with shrapnel when his truck was hit. Private First Class William Anderson recalled that men went to help, but Peddle told them, don't bother, I'm going to die, which he did shortly thereafter. Fifteen more men were wounded, some quite severely. Private Joe Spence saw people no more than 20 or 30 feet away from me who lost limbs because of shrapnel just falling all over. Captain Thomas Wells of the headquarters company was killed not far away when his Jeep was caught in a different artillery barrage. It was the Ghost Army's deadliest operation. George Paddle was an only child. Uh, this is George in Luxembourg a few months before his death. And he's there with a little boy in Luxembourg. And of course, George's parents are dead. He never had any children. So when I bring groups to his grave on the tour or on other occasions, uh, I always tell people, we are his family. We are the ones who have to remember him. And we always lay a wreath there at the grave to remember George Peddle and the other men who died. Because his grave is a reminder that although these deceptions kind of have their funny moments, their whimsical side, that men bled and died to carry them out. Uh, four Ghost Army soldiers uh, died during the course of the war and dozens were wounded. And so this, as humorous as it might be at times, this was serious business. 500 years ago, the great political philosopher Machiavelli wrote these words, though fraud and all other actions be odious, yet in matters of war, it is laudable and glorious. 
the World War II generation is slipping away. To my knowledge, there are now only 17 members of this 1,100 man unit still alive. Um, and they are uh, getting on in years. In fact, of those 17, four of them are over 100 years old. Uh, Gil Seltzer in the upper left is 105. Stanley Nance, who I talked about earlier in the lower left is 102. And the two gentlemen on the right, uh, Bill Enoch and Delbert Weber, are each 100. And, you know, we try to stay in touch with these guys and talk to them uh, as often as we can, especially in the kind of upside down time that we've been in, uh, where everybody's been locked in. We've been trying to be there, uh, uh, sort of talking to them. But it's quite clear that, that they're, you know, they're going, they're going, they're leaving us, uh, which is why we are trying to make sure that they and their extraordinary mission are not forgotten. So we've started, I started and other people with me have started a nonprofit, the Ghost Army Legacy Project to honor and preserve their memory, ghostarmylegacyproject.org. And we got a bunch of different things we're doing. In 2018, I was really thrilled because we got to dedicate the first ever Ghost Army historical marker in Luxembourg in the site of a deception mission there, uh, Operation Bettenberg. And then on the left is a 95-year-old Ghost Army veteran, Steve uh, Bluestein, and the man on the right is the mayor of Bettenberg. Uh, We've also received a grant now from the U.S. State Department, as well as a substantial donation from the Massachusetts Society Children of the American Revolution to help with a second historical marker in France, site of another operation. And we're trying to, we're planning on doing a couple more as well. Over the years, we've gathered quite an archive uh, that veterans have donated material, families have donated material. In November, our nonprofit donated our Ghost Army archive to the National World War II Museum, uh, which will now be its permanent home. And in March of this year, just before the pandemic started, the museum launched a Ghost Army exhibit, something we've been working on with them for over two years. Um, it's called Ghost Army, the combat, car <laughs> the combat Con Artists of World War II. Um, and the opening was amazing. Uh, it was very moving, uh, March 5th, and we had several veterans there. And let me give you a little taste of that. again. was overwhelming, absolutely overwhelming. So that exhibit, uh, the museum has reopened and that exhibit will be open until the end of the year. So, and then it's gonna travel after that. Um, one other thing that we're doing to try to honor this unit is that we are working to uh, obtain official recognition for them in the form of a congressional gold medal. They weren't recognized because of secrecy. I mean, secret for 50 years after the war, uh, we feel it's important to recognize what they did. And so we have been working on a, a lobbying effort and we currently have uh, nearly 150 congressmen and 20 senators who are co-sponsors of this, uh, these bills, S1421 and HR 2350. And, um, you know, we are, we welcome any help in reaching out to senators and congressmen. I will say 
uh, and I used to live in Lexington, Massachusetts, I'm very proud to say that every single congressman and senator in Massachusetts has co-sponsored this legislation. That's the only state where that's true. So uh, we are, you know, it's kind of hard lobbying for this in the pandemic, but we are working and working and we're trying to push forward and, and make that happen. I'm gonna stop my screen sharing here for the final moment or two of my presentation, a minute or two, I guess I should say. Uh, hopefully you can still see me. Can you still see me? Okay. Um, so we're also, you know, it's been 15 years. I've talked to all these veterans, done all this research, but we're still doing more research and we're still trying to learn more. And one of the things that the nonprofit is doing is spearheading a new research project it's kind of ambitious where we are trying to uh, create a bio and photo, brief bio and photo for every single soldier in the unit, 1,100 soldiers, because um, I want to know more than just their names or know more than just the bios of the 25 or 50 people that, that I've talked to. You know, can we identify everyone? Can we find out something about them and something they did after the war? Um, so it's not a simple process, but we are working our way on doing that. And it's been really interesting to learn about it. It's probably not a surprise that Ghost Army soldiers came from 48 states, but I was surprised to learn in our research that um, 22 were foreign born. People came from France and Germany and Austria and Poland and Russia and Italy and Sweden who served in this unit, sort of who had immigrated to the US and served in this unit. It's through this research, which has been conducted by our archivist researcher, Donna Albino, who lives in Salem, Massachusetts, and, uh, and some volunteers, including my sister, uh, Kathy Hurst. It's through this research that we know that there are at least 100 artists in this unit. And we've learned other things. There was one guy in the unit who designed costumes for the Jackie Gleason show. Uh, another turned out to be the uncle of actor Sam Waterston, uh, who I might add was excited to find that out. Still others became mathematicians, inventors, architects, TV producers, public health uh, officials. The men in this unit really went on for a, for a thousand guys. I mean, I think they made a major contribution to uh, post-war America. And I think it's important for us to document their impact over the decades, that that's a key part of the story. And all of this information is available on our website, which can be accessed at, actually, easy way to access it is ghostarmy.org. And we have a lot of material there for people who wanna dive into the story. The Ghost Army story is about people of many different backgrounds coming together to use creativity and imagination to save lives and defeat a deadly enemy. Surely that's something we can take inspiration from uh, in these times. Um, the men of the unit were not textbook heroes, but they put themselves in danger uh, in the line of fire to fool the enemy, buying other soldiers a chance to fight and to live. Uh, as my friend Stanley Nance said, if one mother or one new bride was spared the agony of putting a gold star in their front window, that's what the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops was all about. I think that's something Machiavelli would find laudable and glorious. I do, and I hope you do too. So thank you very much for letting me talk about this today.